right. Hey guys, I'm Kay with Google. Thanks for coming today. I'm very pleased to announce that we have a special guest, Stephen Piercy. Give it up for him right here. So Stephen's here to promote his book, um, Sex, Drugs, Rat and Roll, My Life and Rock. It's a great book. Stephen's the lead singer and frontman in the band Rat. Rat has uh, 10 gold and platinum records. Um, I think sold over 20 million records worldwide and it's played in thousands of uh, shows all over the globe. Too so. many. Too many. So Stephen Piercy, let's do another round here. <sighs> all right. Well, I'm glad I wore these. Mm -hmm. Looking good. Mm. So, sex, drugs, rat and roll. How come you decided to uh, write the book? Um, there, I actually wanted to start it uh, five, six years ago. And there wasn't closure in a lot of things um, having to do with business and stuff, so. Yeah. And then my wonderful drummer, he came out with something, and I actually wanted to title this book Rat Tales. And then he ripped off my title, so I go, I think it's time to write my book. Sweet. <laughs> title definitely fits it. Yeah. Um, so what was it like writing the book? Did you revisit a lot of your old friends and whatnot? Any surprises come up during it? Um, yeah, because I didn't remember like a good three years of that 80s period. Did you remember any surprises? No, I didn't actually. Writing? Yeah, I did remember some surprises. I had to go back to some of my concierge and security guys who are still my, still my really close friends and kept me somewhat grounded back then. Cool. Like I had to go back to them and say, do you remember some of this? Because I don't. <laughs> and they told me, yeah. And they Sounds about right. Refreshed my memory. Um, so in the book, you talked about your childhood in San Diego. Mm. How did you evolve from just being a normal kid to being uh, totally into music and in a band and whatnot? I don't think I was ever a normal kid. But OK. And how did you get into music? Um, we moved to San Diego. My mom actually got remarried and moved to San Diego in 1971 or something. And I was off touring with a race car team. I was a pit guy wanting to be like a drag race driver. And um, she goes, well, when you come back from Indianapolis, which is where it was, um, we're going to be living here. And I went, OK. And I was just plopped in San Diego and just went, oh. Yeah, I can think of worse places, so. Well, it was worse for, for a while. <laughs> and then, um, what was the following question? How did I get into music? Yeah. All right, well, I'm living in San Diego, hanging around with all these hippie pothead kids, and which was no different from the LA pothead kids, except we were probably tougher. Um, <laughs> but I got in an accident, I got run over, and broke my legs and stuff. And, and then uh, I was told that you're barely going to walk, let alone race cars. And so I was in the hospital for like a good six months in traction and stuff. And, and I just, uh, later on in the stay, somebody gave me an acoustic guitar. And I go, OK, acoustic guitar, what do I do with this? So I pretty much just kind of taught myself how to play guitar. Wow, while you were laid up in the, yeah. in the hospital? Yeah. Wow. And when I got out, I just kept playing and playing and kind of adapted to it and just actually started doing the band thing. And that started this snowball effect of like, this is kind of cool. I can party, get laid, and <laughs> whatever. Everyone's and favorite play things. Play music, and it was all cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's talk about Sunset Strip. So uh, do you have any crazy stories from back in the day? What was it like? Oh, huh? God. Well, first of all, would, you know, I got to say, you know, this book is kind of trippy, you know, in a way that there's a bit of embellishment in a good way and, and then in a bad way, because all I wanted to do was tell stories. But as far as the strip, it would take 10 books to even get close to what I would actually would like to say to anybody who wanted to know anything, because I'm a pr really a private person. So for me to do this was kind of like, <laughs> you know, 
I was like actually eating a lot of marijuana pups doing it. <laughs> but it was interesting, but it would take 10 books. But anyway, the strip, yeah, it was interesting because when I moved here, I, I told my band, um, Mickey Rat, um, that I'm moving to LA in 19, January 1, 1980, because that's where Van Halen made it. And they had become my friends um, before they, actually before they got signed in like 1977 or something. Uh, I'd go back and forth from San Diego to LA. And I met him. Some, a friend of mine said, you have to meet them. I mean, oh, go see this band. They play Zeppelin really good. And I'm like, OK. So I missed them at Gazzari's. And then they said they're playing at the Whiskey. And one day, I just went up by myself. And I go, well, bands go to gigs early. So I'm going to go up there early. And I did. And I saw David Lee Roth walking up the steps at the Whiskey. And I said, hey, you want to smoke a joint? And he said, yeah. And I went, OK, I'm in. And I didn't want to meet him. I wanted to meet Ed Van Halen, because I was a guitar player. And I did. And you developed a nice friendship with him, if I recall. Yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, it lasted for quite a while. Um, nice. But that was it. I moved up there, and, and that was the place to be. And I used to sit and watch them on stage at the Whiskey, and just went, oh my god, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. These guys are really good. This is what this is our competition, our real competition. If you want to be in a band, and nobody was getting signed in San Diego, I mean, we were playing huge gigs, and then we moved to L.A. We had to start all over to where we were paying a hundred bucks to not play. <laughs> you know, it's like here's your hundred dollars, go home. <laughs> like, okay. Well, you certainly turned that around. <laughs> yeah. So, um, cool. so do you go to the strip these days? No. No. I take my daughter there to see some bands. Actually, yeah. how ironic is that? <laughs> nice. Yeah. What were your favorite spots back in the day then on the Strip besides the whiskey? Um, well, we played pretty much everywhere. Um, but in the early days, it was you, you'd, you'd have to go to the Rainbow because that's where everybody kind of met. And you would you know, say, I'm in a band. You know, Here I am at the Rainbow. That's it hasn't thing. changed I at all. I have no special place. Yeah. No, the rainbow hasn't changed, but I haven't been there in, in quite a while. Okay. I think the last time I was there, I got a fight or something. <laughs> so I stay away from there. Um, so you mentioned that Van Halen inspired you. Um, yeah. So do you keep in touch with Eddie these days? I, I read something about he used to hide booze at your house and uh, yeah, well, he would he come lived collect up the, it. He lived up the street from me, and he was, I guess, you know, couldn't get away with some things at his house, so he'd just come to my house, and, which is down the street a little bit, a quarter of a mile, and hang out and stash his booze there, or he'd come over and, you know, it, it would all be there. Nice. It was all good. good I mean, everybody used to come by there from, you know, uh, I don't know. Everybody used to stop by there. It was no big deal. Just checking. <laughs> I feel like we need to loosen this up a little bit. Um, I'm loose. You're loose? OK, just making sure. I'm I feel like this is tight. so structured here. Um, no, I'm ready to go. I got up at 530. I get up at 530 every day. Yeah? Do you like exercise and stuff? Or? No, I just do uh, dad chores and what dads do. Nice. Right on. Um, so you went to the strip, and you guys started playing more and more gigs. Yeah. And not the momentum was built up. So at what moment did you like sit back and just you knew that you made it? Um, well, pretty much when our EP, you know, we had a six song EP back in the day, was being played on KMET and KLOS simultaneously. And then, you know, and then our biggest gig, like, like I told you out there, was Santa Monica Civic. Mm -hmm. right down the street or a bit or something. And we knew we were doing something good. You know, you start selling out clubs and they try to screw you on money and whatever, but you knew you, knew you were doing something right. You know? Nice. And um, so tell us about the Rat House in Culver City. I'm a Culver City resident myself. The so. Rat Mansion West. Yeah, how's, what was Sounds that like? Sounds like a mansion, but it wasn't. It was a <laughs> one bedroom apartment that uh -oh. I had. So was mine, I hope I'm not a... Yeah, and Robin and I and Warren lived there with our two crew guys, and we had a one bedroom, 
and there were three beds set up in one room, two cots and a single bed. And I don't know if we were ever there at one time together, but, and our gear. And we'd have these great parties after shows. It's like Motley would have their uh, place near the whiskey. And it was the same kind of thing. You know, you play a gig and you just tell everybody, come to the house after the party or come to the wherever, the, the, the apartment. And you'd have about 150 people at your place. And uh, it was kind of cool because, you know, I, we, I had this refrigerator, this really old, small refrigerator at Ram Mansion West. And everybody who came into the place signed it inside and out of it. Like you would have, you know, Roth or Blackie or Dio or whoever. But it was signed. And to this day, I wish I had that refrigerator. Yeah, a piece of history right there. Did, oh, yes. did, it would did be women in the sign it too, or is it just rock No, stars? everybody signed it. No, okay. everybody, yeah. No. Nice. You can always start fresh with your fridge now. No. <laughs> no? It's one of those goofy big things. So you talk a lot about excess in the book. So amazing stories of women, wild nights, debauchery, all the fun stuff. So Rat is on tour right now. So is it still as crazy? If you want it to be. Yeah. Oh, so that that's kind of means a yes right there, I think, huh? Okay. Sure. sure. So uh, you want it to be? It's there. Nothing's changed. What are the fans like these days? The same. Really? Yeah. Like same women or like? Well, I try to. I, <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, yeah, some of the women are still the same if you call them women. But <laughs> me, um, I tend to take myself out of that system. Okay. I'll hang out, but I don't go there. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, uh, of touring, do you have any favorite spots? Um, you know, cities that you always have a lot, lot more fun in and whatnot? No. Anywhere there's people having a good time, I'd be happy to be there and yell at you. OK. And speaking of women, just back in the day, and you say it was all any favorite cities in the women's sense? <laughs> No, because you could be in the middle of bumfuck and be very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Nice. You have your standards, Florida, New York, LA, whatever. I don't know. I, I've read the book, the though. Same. You, kinda, like, you, you, know, you fancied the more down It's like home. feeding a bird. <laughs> um, all right. So what are the band member dynamics like right now? You, you guys have been, to, you know, been through so much together. Yeah. Well, we kind of still love, hate each other. Yeah. But we're grown-ups, and we get along. We're doing good business, or I wouldn't be involved. And as we get along, we, we've been rehearsing the last couple days because we have a show uh, coming up tomorrow. And our biggest problem is picking songs. That's, that's about it. OK. Yeah. OK. Um, so it's fashion. Good. So you're known for your style. I believe your name is the Cement Pirate. Um, can you des describe? It's not my name. That's what we just called ourselves. <laughs> can you describe your style back then, and then how it's evolved? Um, it's called "I Can't Afford It." So, who do I? <laughs> where do we go to get it? Yeah. No, I would actually have some girls who were friends, and they would work at some high-end uh, uh, stores on Melrose and stuff, and lend me clothes, or until we figured out this image that became the cement pirate look that everybody, you know, that started it. Uh, the 84, 87 kind of look. But it's kind of like just a grab bag. You just, you know, I mean, but the, put it this way. I mean, I say it in the book, and I don't know if people would get it, but I was like, I liked Adamant, you know, and uh, Duran Duran. So I kind of took them both and went. Made a baby? Yeah, nice. and that was us. Cool. And where do you shop these days? Salvation Army. Okay. All right, Bring then. I got this great jacket and pants, actually. <laughs> no, anywhere. Anywhere. Uh, Sweet. Um, so fatherhood. So that your book actually opens with, uh, you know, the birth of your daughter. And yeah. It sounded uh, like you are a bit high at the time, but the event yeah. was, was, was life-changing. So how has fatherhood shaped you? And it's perfect. She's 17, just got a new car. Aww. And... Uh, she wants to go to college, and I'm bringing her up right. It's cool. Oh, that's fantastic. She's a good girl. Good. Except she likes the band guys. She so. likes the bad guys? The okay. band guys. Oh, band guys. So 
So Stay she's up there on the bitch. stage. <laughs> good nice. Kid. She's good. So she's a rocker then a little bit? She no. Likes, no? She okay. just likes music. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, and what can we look uh, forward to in the future with you? Um, well, we're doing shows. Um, I actually want to cut back on doing live performances and concentrate on other business ventures and my race car stuff and other things I've done and created some shows and but we'll be playing. I mean, I, I, I actually do a bunch of solo shows and but I just go out when I want to go out and have a good time. I don't have to go out to go out. Yeah. We don't have to go play 250 shows a year anymore. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So what's up with the, the racing that you talked about? What are well, you doing my sponsor with that? race car has been doing it since, you know, uh, early 80s. And, and I sponsor Top Fuel dragsters and funny cars, and I'm still in the business. I write songs for ESPN2, uh, NHRA drag racing, and just, you know. Nice. I'm in there one way. I'll, I'll be on the track. If you want to <laughs> go to a race, I'll be there. All right. Do you hear that, ladies? I'm the starting line. <laughs> awesome. Um, and I hear you're also working on a new record for Rat, and it's back with Atlantic. Yes. So kind of full circle there. Yeah, we there. are back. Yeah, it's it's Roadrunner is back with Atlantic. Um, it's good. We're getting there. Um, you know, getting us in there is one thing. Hopefully, it won't take ten years like the other one. <laughs> but uh, there's some good songs. I I'm really good songs. You know, Great. Warren and I are writing and. Uh, he played me something not too long ago, and I was just, I actually told him, if we can just release this one song, we're done. It was that good, so oh, I'm wow. very happy, yeah. Nice. Yeah, soon enough. We're, we're gonna, we want it released by um, April, May next year. Okay, great. Um, well, at this time, um, I'd like to turn it over to the audience to ask some questions. Why Do you wanna step up to the mic, my friend? That way we can get, get a good shot of you up and close. <laughs> so as, as you were growing up, um, who were some of your most powerful inspirational musical in, in influences? Growing up meaning mm -hmm. after you got the guitar and, and started to see yeah, that. Yeah, um, I really liked Blue Oyster Cult, uh, Black Sabbath. Um, definitely I was heavily influenced by Led Zeppelin. And I actually got to see him three times, and it was like the most mind-expanding ex experience. The acid that I ate <laughs> couldn't even match <laughs> while I was watching him. But, you know, I liked... Uh, and then Van Halen, when I saw them in uh, 77, 78. But Led Zeppelin, uh, Blue Oyster Cult, uh, those kind of bands influenced me a lot. Hello. How do you even have the memory to write a book? <laughs> I can't remember anything from my college days. Well, I remember quite a bit. And, really? But there, like I say, there were a few years that I couldn't remember. Right. Because we literally were just so busy. I mean, the one thing that kind of put the first nail in the coffin was we did this for so long. You know, we just did tour, record, tour, record, tour, record. and. And then, we, but we were doing arenas, and you know, it was like there was, you didn't know what day it was. Right. You know, where are we? Well, you're still in Texas two weeks later. Right. You know, where are we? <laughs> Florida. How long have we been here? Two weeks. Right. I mean, but those days are over, you know, but. Uh, but to even like bring that all up and have enough yeah. information to write a book, I mean, I well, try to remember stuff. I had, to, I had I to call some friends and. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. What did we do? Cool. Yeah. Cool. So we have a, a, a stairwell in the office that's devoted to rat that nice. we want to take you uh, and Set show you. There. Yeah, mm -hmm. you guys are famous. <laughs> I have a question about how did you get Milton Burl to be in your video? <laughs> mm, good one. Um, our manager was his nephew, Marshall Burl. And Milty did the first video round and round, and, and nobody quite got it then. They kind of get it now. But he was such a clever, smart guy. When he did that video with us, he, he kind of just went in there and took over. 
You, do you know, uh, Don Letts was the director. He used to be in Big Audio Dynamite, if anybody remembers that name. A long dread, dreaded guy. And he kind of just threw his hands up and went, okay. And Milty just took over. And he always told us, keep things, you know, don't be so serious, keep things tongue in cheek, a little, make it fun. And we always tried to do that, you know. Yeah, he was a good guy, Milty. If you could do it all over again, what, if anything, would you change? Business. Some business stuff, that's about it. Yeah. But I would do the same thing again. You know, I wouldn't, I have no, uh, you know, it is what it was, you know. You couldn't do that now, you know. I, I feel sorry for the new bands, because they'd be lucky to hang around a year let alone be able to accomplish or do what we did, like the Motleys and the Rats and the whatever. That was such an, a crazy period, and it was all new. We, nobody knew what was going on. We just created this thing, you know, and just went with it because of the excess, you know. Throw a little success in there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great. Do you mind a follow-up to that question? No. Go for it. When you talk about uh, the business part, some of the things that you would do differently with mm. you were in a band, I'm guessing that there were a lot of different voices about how that handled some of the business stuff, or, or was it just the management just telling y'all mm. what to do and how to do it? No, we were cool for a while, but you know, I would have done it differently because I did so much of a lot of things on by myself for the band. And, but I was one of those guys, all for one, one for all. It wouldn't happen these days, you know. No way in hell, but we're okay. So the, the second word in your title is drugs. How, do you, how important or helpful do you think drugs are in, in the creative process of writing songs and, or rec and recording? Drugs, well. Are they helpful or they are you know, damaging? Well, I, I can't say they were helpful because we lost Robin to drugs. And you know, we all did a lot of everything just because we could, you know. Maybe it was the time or, but you know, I did a lot of drugs before I was even in a band. So to me, it was just like, okay, now we get it for free and a lot of it, so. <laughs> I, you know, you just go, okay, and whatever your metabolism is. Um, so I, I don't suggest that people do drugs to write music or do anything. It does, it's it'll probably hurt you, but. I mean, I'm more specific about, I mean, I understand that drugs can help you have a good time and if you're on the road and mm. playing gigs, but what about when you actually have to write and be creative and sit down with a guitar, come up with a new song, get inspiration and get in the mood for writing. Do you think drugs are helpful or? They could be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> they could be helpful. It depends on what kind of dope you're taking. You know, if, you're, if it makes you pass out, it's not gonna be useful. <laughs> you, you know? loaded for, you said 250 shows in a year. Uh, you guys get loaded for every show. Every day. Every day. Wow. Before, during and after. Yep. Not a bad life. <laughs> it made a bad one. <laughs> Do you have a favorite song that you've written or a song that you're most proud of? Um, well, it, it would be uh, wrong for me to say that Round and Round didn't accomplish a lot, because it did. And it's such a huge tune. It's like we sell that thing to every few weeks to a movie or something, but just the way we wrote that song um, was crazy, because we used to write on two tape decks, cassette decks, and we'd bounce one track one to another until we had you know, everything on one cassette. Um, but for me, I mean, I have an a extended catalog of solo stuff that I would I find more exciting than, you know, what I have to do every day when I do rat, you know. But I still love playing, like, Lay It Down, uh, 
Body Talk. Uh, there's so many rad songs that are so good. You know, that's one thing we could do is play. And we would put ourselves up against anybody just because we know we would kick their ass. You know, and we still could. We still can, you know, in a good way. We love what we do. That's the only thing that keeps this band together, Rat, is our music. Otherwise, we'd, we'd, we'd hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's respect for our music. So you're writing a book. You have your entire life in front of you. How did you decide what you're going to put in the book, where to start? Um, just your process of putting it together. You know, I had a good co-writer, you know, um, and, you know, I was reading Keith Richards' book, Life, and I was reading, I had read uh, Tyler's book. And I was like, if there's some way I can just put those two together, then I, I think I can actually write a book. But I wanted to be honest, you know, I didn't want to bullshit anybody. I mean, some names and some, you know, they, 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 the, the end result is the main editor, publisher, whatever you want to call it, kind of made it into like this script, you know, dialogue, and he doesn't know what we were saying. I don't remember, but it's kind of cool how he did it in, in retrospect, but um, I just wanted to tell some stories and, you know, maybe some the good, bad, or the ugly would influence somebody, or they'd get a kick out of it, you know? And then some of the stuff I don't remember, like the Michael Jackson thing, I didn't remember that, you know? But, uh, you know, I just kind of told stories, you know? So, Hi. Hi. Were you approached by um, the musical Rock of Ages to include any of your songs in that? I don't remember any of them being in it, so. No, but somebody told me recently that they play one of our songs. Really? And we actually have, well, I'll let them know now. There's a lawyer coming after your ass. <laughs> Good. You don't play our song without saying you're not playing. Especially that one song. That good one. With uh, the decline of like CD sales and mm. the amount of money that musicians and labels are making from CDs and now downloads and the audience shifting over to music streaming, mm. uh, which is less, definitely less lucrative than CDs. Mm. What do you think's the future of um, keeping the, the business within music and sustaining people's creative endeavors? Um, for established bands um, who have an extensive catalog like us or something, it would be live performance. Um, or just making sure your music's in the marketplace for new bands, I really feel sorry for. Because, but then again, I don't, because some of these bands that have made it recently have made it from the new format of, you know, music. You don't need a record deal. You just go on the internet and YouTube something or whatever, and next thing you know, you have a hit. That's cool, too. You know, I work with young bands, you know, because I have an independent label. Um, so there are benefits, but uh, for us guys who have the catalog and stuff, you know, we just have to watch what's happening, and make sure their thievery doesn't happen. Then what's her name? <laughs> it was Nick Jagger, I believe, who famously said uh, when he was in his 20s that he'd rather be dead than stand on stage at age 40 and sing Satisfaction. Um, and it's kind of what, what are the biggest changes in and like view of the world of life, whatever, can you talk about from you know the old days and mm. to now? Well, we could party or can party like we used to, but we don't, and we don't suggest it for anybody who wants to have longevity because it does beat you up eventually, you know. Um, but I mean, I I could play music for as long as I feel like it, except nowadays, you know, I'm preparing myself, you know, I don't need to, I just like to do it sometimes, you know? You know, I, me, I've always called, I, I never said I was a singer, and I'll say it to this day. I, I go, when I tell my kid I'm doing a show, I say, I've gotta go yell at some people. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> she knows exactly what I'm saying. Do you want to go? I'm going to go yell at some people. Oh, there's 30,000 people there. Or there's 1,500 people there. Or there's the House of Blues is right down the street. I mean, she's jaded, but, you know, um, it depends, you know. To each his own, you know. Everybody's different, you know. I like doing it. I still like doing what I do. I still like meeting people, and you see them smiling faces. And now there's so many young, younger people going to our shows. You know, it's crazy. And if they're into it, and I see they're into it, it just, you know, just makes me want to hang around. You know. Interesting. Oh God, anybody from uh, Charlton Heston to. Henry Kissinger to Whoopi Goldberg to, I mean, it's crazy, you know. And I'll go right up to somebody and just fuck with them. <laughs> just to say hello, you know. <laughs> hey, Chuck, you're not supposed to be calling me Chuck. Charles <laughs> and Heston, you know. <laughs> or, you know, Henry Kissinger, I'm surprised I didn't get shot when I ran into him. <laughs> I just ran right up to him with a drink in my hand and shit. Hey, what's going on, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> nice. And you had some fun with Ozzy, it sounded like, in the book as yeah. well. Yeah, Ozzy, Uncle Ozzy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rat did an extensive touring with Ozzy, Euro uh, Canada, Europe, and the U.S. And it was a time when, oh God, they were just on his ass, and it was it was interesting. He's 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 a good guy. I heard um, you did something to his uh, shoes. He shit in some shoes. He did? Oh, I thought that was you. No. Oh. <laughs> Me and Bobby hung out with him really late one night, and he was staying at a ho hotels because his kids were like babies then, and they lived out of the bus or something. Well, as a matter of fact, it was Hollywood somewhere, um, really nice hotel, and you put your shoes out there to get shined, you know, and uh, he just thought it would be a kick, I'm gonna shit in these shoes. <laughs> and Bobby had a camera and he took pictures and, and he just couldn't tell, he, he was so eager to wake Sharon up and go, I'd shit in these shoes, <laughs> i shit in these <laughs> shoes. And we were just like, oh God, I left. Goes to show how crazy that night was. I left probably about three in the morning. Him and Bobby were still up partying. So, so, but we got the photo. Nice. <laughs> Shit in the shoes. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you tell us a little bit about maintaining your voice over the years? It's it's your instrument. I know that you said that you that you go and scream at people, which is a great line. Uh, but you know it's gotta evolve over over when you started. And I don't. Know, do you think it sounds the same? I think it sounds good, but like, well, tell, is there, some people is there a say process? it sucks, <laughs> and that's okay too because they buy a lot of things. But um, I, I've never really, you know, I've taken it seriously and stuff. But I, I, I just, I'm from old school. Listening to, like I say, the Stones are mostly Zeppelin, and I like their ad lib and I like the versatility of just doing different things every night. So. The, the problem that, that's done when you make a record is you try so hard to create this one sound or thing, and you can't do it live. And we've made that mistake, you know? That's why I don't do songs like Dance, 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 even though we did. But it's very difficult. Um, and I'll admit it, I, I'll cop to it, I could give a shit, you know? I, I've never bitten into a towel or did vocal warm-ups before I sing. I just have a drink and a cigarette and try to laugh as much as I can and talk, and I'm ready to go. You know, I maybe do some exercises, but that's it. I, I, I take it seriously, but it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not some weird freak about it, because I don't come from that school of singing, you know? Um, and I don't claim to come from that or say I'm some kind of like, you know. It's like I met Paul Rogers one time, right? We did this award thing and we were presenting. And, I, and the first thing I said to him when we went out there, I, they go, yeah, Steven and, and uh, Paul Rogers. And I go, this is like the real singer guy. <laughs> and, he, and he is, he's like, that's like a real singer. 
I mean, I could sing, and I, I do what I do. I'd rather be a guitar player, but I ended up singing, and that was through default, you know? I went into an audition for a band ages ago, and they said, well, we already have a guitar player. Can you sing? And me, I go, I guess. And then <laughs> I got the job. So, I don't know. I'm just going with it, you know? It's a blessing, you know? Something that always struck me about, like, 80s, early 80s metal scene, especially in LA, is mm -hmm. the combination of very masculine behavior, almost macho behavior, mm. combining it with, I wouldn't even call it androgynous, more like outright female mm. clothes and dress sense. Um, I got a pussy and some nuts. <laughs> <laughs> So my question is, uh, uh, what, what made you put on red lipstick and did you ever run into problems? I never put on people red didn't, lipstick. People didn't get it, they didn't understand That it. was that other band, Poison. Okay. No. <laughs> the furthest we got was like maybe rat up our hair, but we were rats, we were, we, you know. But, and that was probably about it, maybe some eyeliner or whatever, but I, no, we never got, went out of our way. So what stopped you from uh, putting on the red lipstick? <laughs> I wasn't attracted to dudes, I don't know. <laughs> I, no. You know, the 80s were an interesting thing. You gotta understand, it was all new. So it wasn't us, like when people tell me, oh, what killed, what killed the, you know, 80s, whatever, it's like, it wasn't us. <laughs> and maybe it was those bands that came after us that were cooker, you know, cookie cutter bands, you know, the, you know, you had all these goofy ass bands that came out of nowhere, and they just poof them all up and find out where we met or who made our clothes. And, but you know, uh, we're still standing. If you've been standing for over 20 years, you, you, you got something going for you. We're almost, th we'll be 30 years next year. Wow. So. Congrats, yeah. <laughs> it's um. interesting. We probably have time for one last question, if anyone has one. Yeah? Have you been approached about doing any reality TV shows? <laughs> I I've, I've actually have a production company that's been writing and working on stuff for years. It's just, I'm not in a real big rush to like fall on my face. <laughs> and it's not gonna be about me. I'll write it, for, I've been writing for other things, you know, but a couple of them are mine, but it's something, and even that is so overblown, you know, I wouldn't want to be trapped in that kind of a scene. I've been offered stuff, but I wouldn't do it because you're, you're labeled some, you know, goof after that. <laughs> it's got to have some substance, you know, <laughs> or I'll have somebody else play the goof. All right, so uh, Steven's book is Sex, Drugs, Rat and Roll, My Life in Rock, available online and in bookstores, and it's a great read. Highly recommend it. Um, thank you, Steven, for coming in today. Thank you. And let's give him a round of applause, guys. <laughs> great.